You're listening to the Curious About Cannabis podcast. The Curious About Cannabis podcast is brought to you by the generous support of fans just like you. Find out how you can support the show and get access to exclusive content, merchandise discounts, and more at patreon.com slash curious about cannabis. If you want to learn even more about cannabis, check out the Curious About Cannabis book at cacpodcast.com slash book, or check out our Curious About Cannabis online courses and educational events at the Natural Learning Academy at learn.naturaledu.com. Hi, I'm Reggie Gudino, VP of R&D at Front Range Biosciences. You're listening to the Curious About Cannabis podcast. Hey, everybody. This is Jason Wilson with the Curious About Cannabis podcast. Thanks so much for joining me once again. So today I'm very excited to chat all about cannabis genetics and possibly even microbiology. We'll see what we get into. Um, but I'm here with uh, Dr. Reggie Gardino. Uh, Reggie, thanks so much for being willing to come on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Absolutely. I, um, you know, I've, I've mentioned on the podcast before, I think actually right before I started the podcast, I think, um, I caught one of your presentations at the Emerald conference, um, back in the day. And I had this mental note that I wanted to come back around and talk to you one day. So this is, this is really, um, exciting for me. Um, and one thing just to kick it off here in case some of our listeners, um, aren't familiar with you and, and some of your work, do you mind giving just a really brief, mm -hmm. Um, introduction to uh, the work you do, uh, Front Range Biosciences, and um, anything else you want to share with the listeners mm -hmm. before we really dive into the science of things. Yeah, so, so um, I think the the genesis of the work that that people know me for, and it's not really me, it's my team, uh, sure. started when we were at Steep Hill Labs. So, so I, I started life in the uh, cannabis industry at Steep Hill Labs. I worked my way from VP all the way to up to president of the company. Um, you know, VP of R&D, I ended up being CSO and then president. And, but what I did there was I assembled a multi multidisciplinary team of scientists that really started to crack the code for, for cannabis genetics. And, 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 you know, there were some other entities out there doing the same thing. Um, but we were the only ones that had taken the approach of, you know, the chemistry needs to kind of lead the, uh, the genetic discovery. So, um, um, unfortunately due to, you know, uh, things that happened in the cannabis industry, um, Steep yeah. Hill ended up selling us to Front Range, the entire R&D team, which actually uh, kind of um, allowed us to hit, you know, second gear, right? Like we'd kind of been yeah. idling and free, right? So um, because we, we were limited on having to work with other people and, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? But um, it doesn't allow for really vigorous scientific, you know, investigation mm -hmm. sometimes. Um and so once we got to, you know, front range, the, you know, we went with all of our skills and IP and, and, and we were now said, told, okay, so take what you've, what you've learned and apply it now. Right. So that was the ultimate test. And that was really cool because, you know, we, we really were able to hit the ground running and, and did, you know, we've only been at, at uh, front range for about 18 months, a little over 18 months. And, and, and we've done some tremendous stuff. So, um, Part of what we built at, at Steep Hill that came over to Front Range was was the ability to you know um, to blast through large amounts of data and and make yeah. make important correlations from that data, um, and 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 from that the early work we 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 had the first sex test you know Steep Hill and Jesus' mm -hmm. first sex test you know um, Gen Kit uh, and then on, on the back of Gen Kit because Gen Kit was kind of built to be modular. Uh, we we put our the first industry CBD test as well. So we had the first yeah. CBD test that was able to identify the, the twenty to one ratio. So um, now that was kind of the the baby steps, right? And then when we got to front range, you know, since then we've you know we published a paper that characterizes the entire terpene synthase family. Um, you know, we've got HPLBD uh, test out that's now being licensed directly to to other laboratories. Um, you know, so, so we've really been able to, with plants in hand, like get to us another level that we would never have been able to at Steep Hill. So 
Um, so it's been it's been a, a really outstanding blossoming of the team. So absolutely, yeah, and it's it's really exciting for someone like me that's been, you know, kind of following um, the research that that you and your teams have been doing and <clears throat> and trying to wrap my head around this. I mean, I was. Uh, in Oregon, I was in cannabis testing labs and stuff too, doing, uh, looking at all this data and just waiting for research teams like this to come around to wrangle all of this data together and make sense of it and, and understand what correlations we uh, understand, which can then help us understand what other questions to ask mm-hmm. to then you know go forward and, and measure other things and, and try to really mm-hmm. uh, tease this all out. I'm glad you brought up the terpene synthase thing because that's definitely something I want to talk about, um, some of the insights from that. Um, one thing I want to start with uh, is kind of starting really basic, and then we'll kind of ease people into more of the hard science. But um, from all of the work that you've been doing, studying the not just the genetics, but the chemistry and the microbiology of, of the cannabis sure. plant, um, what do you think are some common misconceptions that people have about cannabis genetics and what our current understanding is, uh, you know, that sort of thing? So, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I hear a lot, um, and, and, you know, this is sometimes from, from growers who have been, you know, who have produced some phenomenal product out there, and, and, and you would think it would have a, a – maybe a better understanding, but a, a lot of people actually still think that um, CBD comes from the THC gene, right? So uh-huh. that they're actually the same gene. It, they're not, they're, they're actually separate genes. And so, um, you know, I've, I've heard people tell me that, oh, it's, it's just a matter of, you know, how, how you grow the plants as to whether or not they make THC or CBD. And I'm like, no, that's not really how it works. So, um, so there's <laughs> stuff like that. Um, um, I, I think um, uh, the the other largest, and this is probably the most problematic in the industry, is is a lack of understanding of the sex characteristics of cannabis. Right. So, in mm-hmm. cannabis, there is no true female. Right. So you're either a male or you're a hermaphrodite. Right. And in in that hermaphrodite spectrum, right, you can control the expression of any phenotypic characteristic, whether it be the female flower or it be the male flower, right? So, and that's why right. you can, you can see, um, you can see, you know, genetic females produce flower under terms of stress because it's actually the SOS system. It's like, Oh my God, I'm going to die. Let me yep. make a freaking seed. Right. So, so, so in cannabis, you're either a hermaphrodite or you're a male. Right. So, and I think that's the largest misconception. So, and because of that, we have issues with things like feminization rates. What does this really mean? Yeah. Does a feminization rate really tell you anything about the tendency to hermaphrodite, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So um, I, I think that's a huge problem in the industry. Um, and I, and I think until the industry gets a, a test for hermaphrodism, that's yeah. not, not likely to go away anytime soon. And, and that itself is a, a hugely difficult test to, to go after because there are so many genes involved in the stress response that could feed into the pathway to make it seed, right? So, so is it a drought stress? And then it's going to have this pathway in. Is it, in a, is it a predator stress, right? Is it a, a you know, um, uh, a nutrient stress, right? So in fact, right. going way back to the 1930s, uh, Mary Etienne Thibault, she was, uh, and this was, uh, this was a tidbit that was fed to me by Ed Rosenthal, actually. Um, there was a, a nun um, who was doing her, you know, agronomic work, I guess, for a master's or a PhD or whatever. Um, and she had done a study on hemp where you could actually alter the sex of hemp by nitrogen starvation or nitrogen overfeeding, mm. right? So... Um, I don't know if it's ever been repeated, um, you know, to the extent that it needs to be, but, you know, it illustrates the fact that there are so many things that can cause the plant to say, okay, I need to make some seed. Let me start a process. Right. So uh, I think that's the biggest problem that the industry still has no idea about. And, you know, and and it's going to be an important one, you know, to the point where some companies, Oregon CBD, for instance, you know, has gone to the point of making triploids, right? So, so that you, yep. you don't have to worry about hermaphrodism and, and all that stuff because it'll be sterile anyway. So, so yeah, so it, it's, a, it's you, a big problem. 
And can you explain real quick, because uh, the um, the triploidy thing has has kind of been circulating a lot on social media since Oregon CBD has announced that. Can you briefly explain to our listeners that may not be so science savvy what that means? So uh, organisms like cannabis and humans are, are 2N diploid. That means they have a copy of each uh, of their parents, you know, genes or chromosomes, a copy of each of their parents' chromosomes in, in that 2N complement. Um, some organisms, citrus in particular, can uh, can exist at a higher ploidy state, 4N, 8N. Um, generally, you have an even N, 2N, 4N, 6N, 8N. Yeah. The odd numbers are tend to be um, an unstable intermediate and an I don't mean unstable as we mean it in, in cannabis, right? It means yeah. um, so. So, you 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 when you breed a, a four N with a two N, the ends don't. You end up with six N, and when that reduces, right. you end up with three N, right? So so yeah. um, so, and and those odd numbers are the ones where the the triploids, the the you know the pentaploids are the ones that tend to be sterile, right? So, so those are the ones uh, because they have an odd number of, of chromosomes, right? They yeah. end up not being able to, um, to, uh, produce viable offspring after a cross with, you know, so, um, or, the, so, or the, the triploid resultant of a two N versus a four N ends up being sterile and then therefore cannot be crossed to, right? So, so that's what ends yeah. up happening there because you can't, a two N versus a three N is not going to be stable. A three N versus a four N is not going to be stable. So you end up with weirdness, right? So, um, so that, that's kind of the theory behind that. That's been going on in, in agronomics for years, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, the issue with polyploidy is um, it serves a purpose, right? Um, it, it's useful for certain things, um, but the the assumption that a polyploid organism is always going to be superior to the 2N version is absolutely not true, right? And just like anything else in agronomics, you have to then go hunt for phenos that are in fact superior, right? So, so it's not a given that everything that comes out will be superior, so. Yeah, right. The, you still have to do the work yeah. to to find yeah those uh, populations that are, that exhibit whatever traits that you're that you're trying to rely on, and and a couple other points that you brought up, I want to make sure to loop around to because people may maybe haven't thought about this, but the the no true female thing, you know, just for anyone listening that's that's maybe less familiar, you know, you're basically saying that yeah, you may get seeds that present as female. Um, meaning they have pistillate flowers. Yep. Um, but there's always going to be that potential to produce the stamina flowers, yeah. to produce yeah. the male flowers. And so when you're talking about feminized seeds, you're really just talking about what's the likelihood that the initial presentation will be pistillate flowers over yeah. stamina flowers, but, but it doesn't and, tell you what the likelihood will be. Yeah. But but also, so there, then there's the, the pistillate versus stamina, but then there's also the stability under stress, right? So right. how much exactly. stress can you can you sustain before you flip out and turn male? That's, that's yeah, it. exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's probably something a lot of people have have not thought much on. And then the other thing you brought up, which transitions greatly into one of the first things I wanted to talk about, which is, you know, you mentioned the the misunderstanding that there's one gene that's uh, producing cannabinoids, you know, THC and CBD, you know, and that's not the case. And I remember in the talk that I heard you give, I don't know if that was in 2018, 2017, something like that, at the Emerald Conference, you were talking about THCV at the time, um, but uh, talking about how you were in the process of understanding that even when it comes down to one certain cannabinoid, there's often not one gene producing that, that there can be clusters yes. of genes responsible for mm -hmm. producing uh, one cannabinoid. So when you knock out one thing and you think that, okay, I've knocked that cannabinoid out, you know, uh, uh, for this research study or whatever, oh, all of a sudden it pops back up. How did it do that? Um, so can you speak a little bit to that, that phenomenon? Like what's going, what have you learned about how the cannabis plant uh, regulates its secondary metabolism, specifically with cannabinoid production and and where has that journey kind of taken you in in trying to understand all of that? So um, I, I, I'm going to disappoint everybody right now. So so <laughs> we have we haven't gotten very much far further on the how it's regulated aspect. It's <laughs> hugely complicated. We do understand the cannabinoid and the terpenes that they seem so much better, right? So so we do understand um, you know uh, the structure of it. <clears throat> 
<laughs> the structure no in place, the, the structure and placement of the THC and versus CBD genes, right? So THC and CBD tend to be pretty close together, but there's a whole other slew of cannabinoid synthases that are very closely related, are moderately closely related to um, THC and CBD that you know produce things like CBC or some other things. Mm -hmm. Many of the things we, we may not even know what they make it, but but there are a cluster of genes that are around 83 to 88 percent homologous to um, to THC, and and they don't make CBD and they don't make THC, or and they make some stuff. You know, we've cloned some of them and we've put them in test tubes and, and expressed them. We have an idea of what some of them are making, uh, but these genes far far outnumber THC and CBD, like by orders of, you know, orders of magnitude, but, but, you know, you know, you'll have one of each or maybe a couple uh, it's THC, CBD of which maybe only one of which is, is actually expressing. And you'll have anywhere from four to eight or 10 of these other related cannabinoids gotcha. that, you know, and it depends on the variety, right? So different varieties have different clusters of these, what we call paralogous genes. Um, and so there's a lot that we still don't under know. And, and, and when are these things on or off, right? So are they yeah. on or off, right? So, uh, right. so just right knowing now, they're there is not enough. Right. Right. So, so, so now we're doing RNA studies where we're, where, where we're isolating flower, mid flower, you know, final flower. We're looking for the, uh, for expression of these other genes now and, and to try to understand some of, of, of what that looks like, uh, looking at, you know, promoter elements upstream of the, of the genes that make things so we can see what, you know, how, how are the promoter elements different? Can we glean everything, anything from their temporal expression or whatever based on the, the patterns we see upstream? And that's turned out to be horribly complicated. Um, so, um, so realistically, you know, we, we've, we've made a lot of progress on the structure of the genes. Um, um, but there are so many and, you know, we're really at the point where we're just starting to do some of the uh, proper expression studies, right? And, and, and then you, you multiply that by the fact that we've just been talking about the cannabinoid genes, the terpene genes, which there are actually more, uh, significantly yeah. more, right? So there's three to four times more terpene genes. You know, they're all built the same way, right? The, so, you know, um, with weirdness upstream and, you know, clusters of genes that are closely related and of uh, one or two small differences, well, does it make the same product or does it not, right? How do we know? So so we're trying to clone all those suckers too and, and, and try to figure that out. It's a huge amount of work um, <clears throat> and it takes a long time, unfortunately. So, so, so unfortunately, we're, we're not really that much further along in the understanding of the expression patterns we do know that there's a vast difference in, in, in expression. So what we've done is we've taken uh, trichome libraries and flower libraries from different varieties, and we've we've looked at the expression of the various genes inside those. And if you do a heat map of six different varieties, there's no relationship. Even though some of them make the same terpenes, heat maps look totally different. There's there's you know. And, and what we were con contemplating doing is taking the same genetics, right, and growing it in different ways and then doing the same experiment to see what the heat map change looks like in the RNA expression. We haven't gotten that one done yet. But, you know, there, there's, a, a, there's so many things that we just don't understand yet about yeah. why these things are being made, when they're being made, um, you know. Um, and, and, you know, to complicate matters further, right, <laughs> because this is biology. Um, so if you look at other... At other organisms, right, you'll see the same exact terpene gene, right, with a different leader sequence. And so they're put in different compartments in the cell. And the same exact gene with a different leader sequence will make two completely different products because of the area that they're directed to in the cell to make what they make, right? And so based on the precursor that's in that subcompartment, is what some of these genes, which are multifunctional, will make, right? So some terpene genes can use GPP, some terpene yeah. genes can use FPP, some can use yeah. other stuff, right? So so now the same genes making four products because it's in four different places, right, or three different places. So <laughs> it's crazy. So well, I, I I love highlighting that complexity um, because I think um, often people assume that that we scientists have more figured out than we do uh, not that we don't not that we haven't learned a lot but you know it's <laughs> like one of those things uh, and something i i 
I teach a lot about sort of just cannabinoid science in general, but when I talk about the endocannabinoid system, I explain something very similar that like you can't can't talk about the endocannabinoid system as this one thing that your body's producing these cannabinoids. You know, it's like every every cell, every tissue, it's all different. And it just depends on all of these different variables. Um, and it gets just very, very complicated really, really quick. And we have to kind of have some humility there to recognize uh, what we don't know, which then tells us what questions to ask. Um, we don't and, know a lot. We don't yeah. know a whole bunch. <laughs> Which is so. exciting as scientists because it just means we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> so in some of the studies we've done, we, we found a population of terpenes that is only expressed in the in the roots. That's it. Uh, there's a, a oh, bunch wow. of genes that and and they and when you do, you know, uh, tissue specific analysis, there is a bunch that they express in the roots and they're never seen anywhere else. So, so you yeah, mean so, like triterpenes and things like that. No, actually some of them are monoterpenes. So, oh, wow. so that, okay. So, so that, so that raises a whole different kind of yes. question. So monoterpenes are built to be volatile. So why would you put a volatile terpene in the dirt unless it's trying to do something, right? Mm -hmm. So, so now you, now we have established that there is in fact communication between the plant and its environment. So, Yep. And, and that gets into your microbiology because now exactly. are we trying to condition the soil to attract the right things and repel the wrong things and make the ni yep. a nice microbiome that we can interact with, with our mycorrhizae on our roots and all the other good stuff? Yeah, so it, 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 it is a symbiosis. It's, it's a communication yep. and, and it's a, you know, working together with, with what you got. So Absolutely. Cool. And, and now you're talking about chemical ecology, which I just yep. find so, so fascinating. Um, and, and that's something in years down the road, whenever I can break myself away from analytical chemistry stuff, that's, uh, kind of a lot of my, my graduate work was really more focused on, on that type of stuff, looking at, um, uh, fungal interactions in, uh, in soils with plants and stuff. And I would love to, to one day be able to, uh, try to look at, at some of that, um, you know, microbiome research or around the roots, um, because we really, once again, we don't know anything. We don't know how, you know, uh, the plant is really influencing microorganisms in the soil, uh, what uh, inoculants that growers might be using, uh, mycorrhizal inoculants and stuff. I know from some of my research that uh, if you're pampering a plant, a lot of times mycorrhizae don't even really like to associate with those plants because there's, there's this interesting sort of balance there. I, I always explain it's like, if the fungus doesn't feel like the plant needs anything and they don't have much to offer each other, then, you know, you don't see mm -hmm. much association. It's a way oversimplified way of explaining mm -hmm. it, but, uh, it's, you know, it's, that, that kind of stuff has been on my mind a lot. Um, so I'm, I'm stoked that you, you brought that up. Um, I remember in a conversation we had, you mentioned you had an interesting story about, um, was it Jaeger? Uh, the, uh, we were talking Jaeger about Morgan. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What was the, the story that you were yeah. mentioning uh, about so, that? So, um, we Jesus, if you're listening to this, Matt, dude, you're, uh, I need that plant again, dude. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, um, so uh, at an Oregon, um, you know, cannabis conference, uh, you know, in Portland, um, a buddy of mine, Ken Kovash from GI Grow, uh, he introduced me to a guy whose name is we Jesus in, in Oregon, right? Yeah. And, um, he's very well known and, and, and he's, and his variety that he's well known for in Oregon is, is a strain called Jägermeister. I'd never heard of it before. Like literally I'd never heard of it before. <laughs> and like, and he, he like literally he pulls this already rolled joint out of his pocket. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so it wasn't fresh, right? Like, yeah. so, and that's important, right? Cause terpenes go away quick when you grind. Yeah. Right. So, so he, this thing out of his pocket and runs, and I'm like, dude, what is that? He goes, I call it Jägermeister. I'm like, I'm like, it smells just like Jägermeister. I'm like, I literally had never smelled anything like it. It smelled, if you were to open a bottle of Jägermeister, yeah. this is exactly what this, with this variety. That kind of smell licorice like. kind of, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I was like, I don't believe it. Right. I, I'm like, you, you treated it. You, you did something to it. Right. So he, then he pulls out a jar and we grind one up and it smells just like that. And I'm like, holy crap, dude. So like, so here I am in Oregon right? and I'm like, dude, can I get cuts of this thing, please? Really? So he went home and he brought me a cup the, ne the cut the next day at, at the conference. <laughs> and then I had to try to get it home. Right. You know, right, so it yeah. would survive and it didn't, it died, unfortunately. Oh, man. Um, and so, um, 
so I never did get to experiment on it, but like some, so we, Jesus, if you're listening, dude, I, I, let's hook up. I, I want that plant. I'll, and I'll, I'll make you famous brother. So, um, so oh, for real. Yeah. And it is, it's such a distinctive yeah. smell. And, and certainly here in Oregon, Jaeger has mm-hmm. been uh, a very, very popular strain, at least up until, mm-hmm. uh, you know, through like 2000, 14, 15 or so until mm-hmm. maybe a year or so ago. I mean, mm-hmm. it was ex- incredibly yeah. dominant everywhere. And then crosses, you know, everyone yeah. trying to play with it and and do interesting things. It does have that that very interesting smell. And it, it shows um, what surprises are in store. Uh, Absolutely. And, in the oh, future I'm, of breeding. I, I'm so glad you went there. So um, <laughs> land races, right? Land yes. races. Oh, my. So. Um, I have, you know, we, we, THCV is one of the things that, you know, FRB is making a splash about it right now. So, so that came out of, you know, uh, breeding a bunch of stuff, land races, um, you know, um, ironically, people seem to think that THCV, uh, is a, is a African central South African thing. It's actually not an uncommon mutation. Um, mm-hmm. So we, we, we've done some looking at it. Some other people have done some looking at it. And there's a number of genes that, you know, any uh, we, we have found barren producers in the United States that have mm-hmm. no African background, right? So, um, so uh, some of the genes are known, but again, this is one of those diagenic or more, at least diagenic, you know, um, traits where, you know, there seems to be an on-off switch and there seems to be a throttle switch, right? So, ah, so, yeah. um, so, you know, do you make it? And if you make it, how much do you make? Right. So what, what and, and there's a, a very, you know, seems to be complicated dynamic there that we're trying to figure out. So, and, and um, but what, but the reason I bring that up is because you find all of these really incredible things and and the stuff that we tend to forget about, right? Like the stuff that doesn't look so good and fiber and land races, you know, that are stringy and lanky and don't produce 18,000 pounds of bud. Right. So, (laughs) um, but at the same time, those are the places where you find the least amount of, of genetic, um, monoculture. Right. So, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, for lack of a better way to put it, right? So, so you know, we've we've done so much inbreeding, not even inbreeding, right? So, so we, we've I think we've done so much genetic bottlenecking, right? Because yes, we've taken yeah, yeah. we've taken a a set of germplasm, right? Yep. And then we've worked the crap out of it, and yeah, they're all interbred amongst each other, but you're still dealing with that many genes, right? Yeah. As opposed to that many genes, right? So, um. So my thing has all been always been land races and things that are not the popular stuff. And so, um, so this a couple of years ago, I, I I did a lot of work with some land races and Congolese and stuff like that. And we've actually got a, a series that are coming out right now um, that are all based on on some of those you know Congo crosses. And and let me tell you, I mean, yeah. So they may not put out twenty eight percent THC, right? But they're putting out. 20, 22, 24% THC. And, and people are saying, wow, dude, I haven't smoked anything like this in decades. Well, that's okay. That's, that's what I want. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I, I don't want it to be, Oh, let's go sit on the couch and get stoned. Right. I want yeah. there to be that cerebral high, the focused energy, you know, also, so that's, and that's the interplay of the cannabinoids, knowing the cannabinoids and knowing the terpenes and, and knowing what combinations have to go together to get what you want. Right. And I think, we only see some of that these days in some of those more esoteric land races and, and other things that have not been worked to death because, you know, it's not all about the THC, right? And and I think the other thing that we're seeing these days is that that chase for 35% THC, which <laughs> arguable whether we're actually getting there or not, uh, you know, right, yeah. right, right, is, so that chase, right, so people, the other misconception, right? Cannabis can do whatever you want it to do all the time. Well, no, it's a plant, right? And, and it's a closed loop system, right? That, you know, and, and you understand what I'm talking about there, right? Yeah. Energy in equals energy out, right? And the energy in is sunlight and, and whatever, but the, the energy out is bud, right? And at the yeah. end of the day, you have, it, you have X amount of energy that you can convert into X amount of stuff. And that stuff is flower mass, That stuff is terpenes, it's cannabinoids. So if now you have 30% or more of your dry flower weight is cannabinoids, 
Well, you should expect that you're not going to see a lot of anything else. Right? You're not going to see 30% and 5% terpenes. Yeah, you might once in a while in a super duper plant that's a fucking mutant that you is is not really right. re- reality, right? And that's why we we keep those yep. things, right? So, um, but the reality <laughs> is is that you're you know not every plant is going to get there, and you're going to have to work really hard because. At the they all start and as again as you know they all start from the same precursor right isoprene so if you have yep. the same precursor feeding two pathways right some's going to give if you pull more this way you're going to get less this way it's 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 yep. it's energy flux it's the way things operate so yep yeah it's just the i mean it, there's there's really no other other way around it and um uh, you know I remember you you brought up in the talk that I heard where you were talking about THCV, you were um, talking about a strain that was floating around. I haven't seen it much lately, but Doug's Varen. Doug's Varen, that was the original. That, that was the one that, you know, so Steve Hill and Halen, actually it was Halen. So Don Land and mm-hmm. Kimron before they, or around the same time that they joined Steve Hill. So it was Steve Hill and Halen, and then they were the two best. They came together and that, that changed the industry, right? So, yeah. um, and I think, um, you know, so Don and Kimron had been working with Doug Jenks, the guy who had, who had um, originally bred that at Halen and then brought him with them to Steep Hill. So, you know, we were the first to kind of identify uh, THCV in a, in a plant, in, in, at least in North America. Um, and then, um, you know, Doug and, and uh, the then uh, uh or the original co-founder, or the original co-founders of CPL, David Lampack, went into business and they formed something called, I believe it was uh, California Cannabinoids or something like that, where they were they were selling Doug's Varen. Um, you know, I, I'm not trying to bash Doug's Varen, right? So Doug's Varen yeah. was the original, and it's and it, it still, you know, it was the, the, one of the first one to ones that we saw, right? Um, mm-hmm. But it was a hard plant to grow. It, it, it didn't people didn't get a lot of yield. It was difficult to make flour. Da, 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 right? so, so that explains why it kind of, uh, yeah, its presence yeah. on the market kind yeah. of, kind of ebbed and flowed. Right. Um, and, and what, uh, what concentrations of THCV have you seen in some of these plants that you've been able to study? So, um, right now, uh, day Slayer, the one that we created is actually one of the uh, highest producers in, in North America. So we're hitting between eight and a half, nine percent. That was grown in the oh, wow. tent. Okay. That was grown in the tent. We've actually never grown mm-hmm. it outdoors before at, at all. Uh, we're, we're we're doing it in a greenhouse right now. We have some some elite partners that we are you know we we are trying to um, give them early access to it. Uh, the first elite partner is uh, coming. It's coming down next week, so we'll see how it does in a greenhouse. So, but nice. again, it. So m- the limitation I had when I first got to Front Range was that, was that we were really a hemp company, right? And we mm-hmm. and we were um, and the the cannabis operations was really just a nursery service, you know, to developing, mm-hmm. you know. And so um, when we decided to start working cannabis to produce our own varieties, right, I, I had to do all my breeding in a tent and all my uh, evaluation in a tent before I was given a greenhouse space. So, so all my early stuff was actually done in a tent, and and I got a lot of shit net from some very, you know, some very deep <laughs> cannabis friends. They're like, dude, what the fuck are you doing doing this in a tent? I'm you, doing what I gotta do. I'm like, they, they're like, get that shit away from us, right? So, <laughs> so. So we put it in the greenhouse, right? So, so, and, and, and they were right. All the shit that we grew in, in the tent looked way better in the greenhouse. So, um, yeah. and we're just getting around to putting uh day slayer in there right now. And so, we'll, we'll, you know, in our own greenhouse, we have a, a partner that's coming down next week. So, um, you know, so we're working on it. Um, you know, what we were able to do, uh, you know, by going in and searching for other, ver- you know, TC varieties and, and some breeding was, you know, it's day slayer puts out, you know, and again, I'm I'm using Doug's Varen, and I'm not trying to bash Doug's Varen, right? But it puts out yeah, a lot more course. weight than Doug's Varen did, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it's getting t- it's it 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 has the same ratio, right? So THC victory, there's a whole bunch of stuff that have the one to one ratio, right? But they so they have the on the right on off switch, but they don't have the right yeah. throttle switch, right? So so Doug's Varen was putting out four or five, I think, when I was there. I don't know how much, you know, I don't I don't know. I've seen any recent COAs, but you know, I think the the most we've ever seen out of Doug's Varen was was probably around six or seven percent one to one. You know, so we're we're hitting eight and a half, almost nine percent now, right? So it you know it's it's 
it's got and it's got significant weight, right? So like it's making a lot more mass than Doug's Farron used to make. So so we we got a couple of wins there. It's not the prettiest flower, I'm gonna be honest, right? Um, you know, um, I'm working on that, you know, but at least we say, have that comes with time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. So, so now you know, the, the, the perfection of the variety. Exactly. Right. So this is normal agronomic behavior. You, you get the traits that you want and you pretty it up. Exactly. Right. So, yep. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I think some people uh, 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 don't appreciate that because, you know, sometimes breeders will show what they're working on and it may not look so great. Um, and they're so excited and people are like, why are you so excited? Like that yeah. looks like trash. And it's yeah. like, well, it's about where it's going. Not, not, yeah, right. <laughs> not so, where, so, where so the, now. The proof, this is the proof of concept. That means that what we're getting to is going to happen. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Well, let's, uh, let's switch gears here and talk about terpenes. So, right. um, can you describe a little bit about, um, some of the takeaways from, uh, the recent paper, um, that uh, you and your team put out about terpene, sy terpene synthase genes. Uh, what should people kind of um, understand there and, and kind of where is the research heading um, on that side of things? So um, that's a great question. So I, I'm almost speechless because I, I don't know which way to start. Uh, so oh, that's great. That's great. So, <laughs> so, so let's start with the, um, what did we find, right? So we found, you know, 50 something complete genes. We've done some more work. We're actually up around over 60 something. Um, now, wow. as it turns out, you know, and I'm sure he's going to hate me for saying this, my, my director of information, um, you know, or bioinformatics and, and, and gene discovery, uh, Keith Allen, um, came to me a couple weeks ago. He goes, uh, so, you know, I think I may have underestimated the number of genes. I, I, I found I, I found a bug in, in my um, in my algorithm, and I, I think I'm I'm off by some. I'm like, well, how many? He goes, I don't know, six, eight. I'm like, yeah, that's a dude, fifty-five versus sixty-one. Who cares? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, um, so yeah. So, so we we found a few more. Um, but what's come out of that really is is that we we've, we've we've got breeding markers, right? So now, yeah, so now yeah. I can go after terpenaline dominant genes and, and now I can go after alpha pine dominant genes and, 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 you know, we have, we can screen things and, and, um, and we can, and we can, you know, start to put ideas around functionally, functionally bred varieties, right? So, yeah, um, yeah. You know, so we spent a lot, of, and and I and some of this is proprietary, so I can't go into too much. Stuff, but we spent a lot of yeah, time, you know, with with our data analyst teams. And so, you know, as an aside, you know, cannabis is big data, right? So cannabis is big data, no matter how you look at it. But it's not even cannabis, the industry that's big data. It's the a single plant is big data, right? Like there are so many flipping things happen in that plant, so many compounds. I mean, literally. A single cannabis, you know, if you did a full looking for every compound that came out of cannabis, <laughs> you, you would have yeah. a single plant would keep you busy for a freaking year, right? So yeah. let alone making comparisons. So there's so much stuff in cannabis, right, um, uh, that, you know, actually that's, you know, we've actually had to come up with new ways to go after some of that data, some of that dimensionality of that data, right? So there's so much data structure, right, in, in, in cannabis. Um, so, you know, um, you know, so getting back to the terpenes, so, so what, what it's allowed us to do is to, to, to start to look at, because of what we've done with understanding terpenes and the environment and terpenes and effects on organisms, right? So those are two two things that, you know, not a lot of people talk about, right? But, but if you look at the environmental effect of terpenes and you look at the, that, uh, the effect of terpenes on organisms, all organisms, right? Not just humans, yes. right? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of information there, right? So what we've done is we've actually put together, and some of this is actually in, in you know, intellectual property that we filed, is methods of, of act or, or varieties that are bred for a specific purpose. You want a variety that's going to make you not hungry, very focused and energetic. Right. We know, we know what combination of things to put together, right? You, you want something that's going to help you sleep at night. We know what terpenes need to go together, right? So we, you know what, you know what corn borers are affecting your plants 
in the field, we know what to breed for to make the corn borers go away, right? So so we've put a lot of energy into some of that type of understanding of the terpenes so that we can actually now have a better platform to go breed functional cannabis that does what it's supposed to do. Right. It's like a formulation at the very, you know, up end of the stream, uh, trying to get the plant to produce the resin profile you want so that you don't have to manipulate it uh, later down the road. You can just extract it or use it herbally or whatever. Um, and you end up saving quite a lot of energy and time um, in doing so, which is, well, uh, among and, other things. Right. And, 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 and so I, I don't know about the cannabis industry per se, but the hemp industry, right. You know, everybody's mm-hmm. talking about, Oh, we want, we want, you know, organic CBD plants. Okay. Let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Right? right. So, but the, but, but getting towards a functionally derived plant yep. that has the proper terpene combination gets you part of the way there. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, That to try to identify the the sort of like natural resistance to different things. I mean, and an example of this that I'm familiar with is in corn, um, particularly around the the terpene beta caryophylline. I remember Mm -hmm. reading a a story about, um, you know, that basically through intensive breeding of corn, a lot of the, the essential oil content of corn kind of faded away over the years and you lost a lot mm-hmm. of things, including beta caryophylline. And what agronomists sort of discovered is like, hey, uh, these corn varieties have basically no resistance to root knot nematodes. Uh, so we really need to breed that beta caryophylline back in uh, so that we get some resilience. And so what you're talking about is something like that, but orders of magnitude uh, more interesting because you're already you're looking at it from so many different angles um, already. So, it, yeah. No, sorry to interrupt, but but yeah. No, go for it. So because of our training, right? So so we're not coming at this from cannabis is something you smoke, right? Yeah. Right. I'm a I I deal in phytochemical agriculture, right? So yeah. My job is to determine what the little factory that I'm growing will make for me. Yeah, that's it. So yeah, and I know that completely de- de-romanticizes the cannabis industry and and the mystique behind cannabis, right? And 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 personally, I love that, right? So yeah, as a too, as yeah. a as a person, I'm all about that, right? But as a scientist, it doesn't matter what the fucking plant wants to do. It's what can I make the plant yep. do? What can I get out of the plant? And 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 what purposes do those compounds serve in some downstream formulation or, or something or other. Right. So, um, right. And, and, and I, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes I think I run afoul of the industry because I talk like that, right. Because it's not about (laughs) the plant, right. It's about what the plant can do for us. Right. So, um, yeah, Yeah, I've I've experienced the same same sort of thing. I tell people I get, I weirdly get hate from all angles because I speak so like, I don't know. It's, I, I think that's just the, the plight of, of scientists, especially analytical scientists. Uh, you know, um, I don't know, but that's just the, the way it goes. But this actually relates to a, a sort of more philosophical realm of things that I wanted to explore with you, scientist to scientist, which is what is it that really gets you i can tell when we talk about certain things your energy changes you get really excited and uh, so one thing i i like to to ask people is just uh, what is it about this type of work that you really like so much that really gets you so so passionate about it and is it something that's you know specific to cannabis or is it broadly about biology and and life in general and studying that um, but i kind of want to just get your your take sort of your your philosophical stance so like what is it about all of the science that really gets you going um so it's a little bit of, of two things right so so one of the things you are you know is it just because you're a scientist and you well yes right so i i look around me at wonder at everything like i can i yeah, can be yeah. i can be walking down a street in the city and if somebody's got a beautiful iris on their on their porch yes. i will stop yes. and take a picture of it 
right? Yeah. Like literally, right? God, yeah. I've just seen natural beauty that has caught my eye. And for that moment, I'm captivated, right? So, so I, so for me, that the, the world around me is just this fascinating thing. And, and I, maybe I was born that way, but I, I spend hours at night looking at the stars. I have astrophotography. Yeah. I have thousands of oh, dollars awesome. of camera equipment and, and I spend ridiculous amounts of hours, you know, focusing on things that are millions of miles away. Right. So, um, but it's, it's just that nat- natural beauty to me, right? Like everything in the, on, on the planet earth is, has its beauty and, and its energy and, it, and I'm attracted to it all. Right. So, so that's generally about me, but, but overall, right. Um, cannabis represents I'm a kid, dude. I'm, I'm just a big kid, right? So cannabis is the ultimate sure. sandbox. Like it's the never ending sandbox with more toys that get dumped in every single day. Like every day, there's a different thing for me to I'll go and look at, right? So it, it is in fact, like, you know, for somebody who's, you know, ADD like me, it's, I mean, I'm never bored, I'm never bored, right? So <laughs> yeah. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and so. and do you, do you think of some of this sort of like building with Legos or something? I mean, oh, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I a lot of times think of this stuff. I've always, you know, growing up, and that, uh, one reason why I like to ask stuff about this is because I, I don't necessarily think it matters whether you're whether society tags you as a scientist or not. I do think there's a um, there's just this sense of wonder. I think that often leads to becoming a scientist um, because you're wanting to understand how things work. But I I always uh, think of, I was talking to uh, uh, if you're familiar with Mark Sheldon. Uh, interviewed him, a chemist on the podcast, and we sort of talked about this. But it, when you're, especially when you get into molecular biology, um, it very much feels like you're you're sort of tinkering and and playing with a. I like that you said sandbox because it very much is kind of just yeah. like a big sandbox and tinkering. And you know, growing up, I always broke down computers and VCRs and stuff and wanted to see how they worked and then put them back together and. I see that translation into biochemistry and everything where it's like, I'm playing around. I'll see what happens. I learn a little bit. I build something else and it. And it just feeds that, that, that drive just to, to, I don't know, just to, to fiddle with things and, and to understand what that teaches you about all these other things that, that you, uh, that you see in life. Yeah, um, no, I, I agree. And, and so it's, you said so many things that resonated with me, right? So, um, but but it is that natural sense of wonder and and the sense of tinkering like so you know we, I told you so we we clone the genes and we put them in little artificial constructs put them in a test yeah. tube right make them make protein isolate the protein and feed it stuff right to right, see what it right. does right like that's like taking part of the system out isolating exactly. it right like and then put it's a, you know and then because and and that's the other weird thing about science right is like so many scientists are so caught up in the the minutia, right? Like, yeah, so yeah, we yeah. all, you know, we become experts about that much, about such a right, tiny little right. thing. Right, right, tiny sliver. Right? Right? Um, and so what cannabis has allowed me to, or forced me to do, right, has been to, to take a step back and say, okay, yeah, we get this, but how does this plug into that, right? Because, you know... Where's the connection, right? So, you know, um, and so that that's been a really outstanding part of this is is to be able to get down into the as you said the molecular biology, you know, working with individual single proteins in a test tube, but being able to take that information and go back and plug that into the, the larger picture, right? So, that's you know that's like that's a, an artist working on a mural, yes. right? Yes. But then having to come back and focus on the detail in a, in a single face in that whole mural, right? Yes. So, so that's so I don't know how, else it, but that's exactly how it all fits together for me, right? And and, and it's it's just a yeah, fascinating. It, it keeps me excited, you know. I mean, I'm almost sixty years old, and people are like, oh, dude, you look like you're in the thirties. Well, no, I don't. You're just being polite, but but I I do have, <laughs> but but I I I know that I have friends who are almost sixty who sit around and watch TV all night. Uh, yeah, you know so. Um, yeah, no, um, absolutely. It's uh, in some ways. I feel, well. First of all, I'll say I feel the same way about cannabis in general. One thing I've enjoyed about being in the space is the ability to approach it from so many different angles. And because it's so new, you sort of uh, there aren't a lot of the institutional roadblocks um, that you would run mm-hmm. into when you want to study other plants. Um, 
And so you're you're really able to to dive in. And what popped into my head, it's almost like you have to learn how to master and coming into your your um, um, astrophotography stuff. It's like you have to learn how to master the telescope, how to uh, and and the microscope simultaneously. How right. to zoom out? How to zoom in? Yeah. How to make these connections? How to think in systems? And mm-hmm. and what has really gotten me excited lately is taking everything. You know, I've I've been studying cannabis for about the past decade, roughly, and and now I'm at this point where I see a a lot of biology differently because of the work that I've done in cannabis, and now I'm thinking about other plants that I've studied in the past. I used to work with the BLM as a botanist going around surveying native plants all over Southern Oregon. Now I'm like, well, you know, what's going on in those plants? And what are some things that we haven't, you know, what are some lenses that we can now use to look at other organisms that maybe we haven't appreciated so much, but because of cannabis, it's kind of brought to the forefront how important some of those lenses can be. Like, trying to understand better the chemical ecology what are terpenes you know doing to communicate with uh you know the surrounding environment what are the what's the potential of these plants that hasn't been tapped yet what are they what can they possibly do that you know we're unaware of and then of course thinking about therapeutic contexts um you know what are the potential uh drug discoveries that haven't happened yet oh um, and, and and that's I'm glad you brought that up cuz that's that's a, that's one of the things that came out like completely unexpected. And I know a couple of people have, are talking about it now. I think we were the first to talk about it. But when, you know, getting back to the cannabinoid genes we were talking about, there are so many. Well, you know, we, we, we kind of cut it off at this, you know, I said 83 to 88%. Well, there's another class that's down even further away, right? And as it turns out, cannabinoid synthases are actually part of a larger family, a super family called the berberine bridge enzymes, right? Now, ironically, yeah. right, so so this is all stuff that comes out of, you know, and, and, and it is the lens onto other plants. Well, berberine bridge enzymes are hugely important, right? It's, it, it's, it's what we get our, all our alkaloids from, opium, all the, the opioids, all, all of these things are, are berberine bridge. So, so now here's another thing. Some of these berberine bridge genes that we don't know what the hell they do, they're just there, are expressed at higher levels in the trichome than the cannabinoid synthase mm. genes. What does that tell you? We, there's a whole co- class of compounds in, already in the trichome. We have no freaking clue what it does. Right? And it may yes, be yeah. some sort of other medically important because right. a lot of the alkaloids have turned out to be medically important. Right. So, yep. so there's also, yeah. You know, so, and, and then well, that's, that brings up another thing, right? So, so now that we've seen that when we go look at things, Holy crap, dude, there's yes. a whole bunch of these genes out there in the plant kingdom. Like yes, yes. liverworts make THC with a benzene stuck on the end, right? Like, right. Uh, but it doesn't have a THC synthase. So how's it doing that? Right. So, so, so obviously the cannabinoid structure ended up being an important structure in the plant kingdom because other plants have gotten there or to things. There's a heli, helichrysum, heli, yeah. the CBG. I the species name, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, hila, uh, dude, I hate that. I yeah. Can't. yeah, it's the helichrysum. I, I just can't remember the, yeah, the species it, it, name, but I know uh, exactly what you're talking about. Atalicum. It's a helichrysum. Mm-hmm. So it's, it, and it's, it, it, Italicum, like it comes from Italy, right? But but it's the South African daisy, right? Like, go figure yeah. that one, right? Um, right, I know. <laughs> it's, right, but um, but it's one of the highest CBG producers out there, right? Like, it makes yeah. CBG. It doesn't well, like have, the, uh, it doesn't, but it doesn't make it the way cannabis makes it. Well, and there's like that rhododendron that makes, um, I'm going to butcher the name, but it's like ferruginine or I can't remember the the chemical compound, but it's very, very similar to CBD. Very, very slight modifications, but extremely similar. Um, And, you know, and that's, that's been on my mind is, you know, going into, and this segues perfectly into one of the last things I want to talk about, which is the future of cannabis research. But you know, I, I I feel very strongly that even our our basic conceptions of what a cannabinoid is is going to evolve quite a bit in the Absolutely. next ten years. Absolutely. Um, and what we call cannabinoids and endocannabinoids too. So I've got several things in my mind. Hopefully, I remember to come back to all of them. But you you know you mentioned the 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 super class of compounds. You know, so 
uh, talking about endocannabinoids, I, I tried when I work with um, clinicians to try to kind of shortcut them into thinking about these things. I'm like, you know what eicosanoids are, don't you? Yes. You know, you know what leukotrienes are, you know, you know, you know, all these things. Endocannabinoids are eicosanoids. Like they fit into this, this broader <laughs> class. And, and then it's like, oh, okay. So yeah, they're involved in immunomodulation and blah, blah, blah. You know, then they can rattle off all right. these things they've learned yeah. about eicosanoids. And it's like, yes, but they're, you know, but they have slightly different activity than these other things, but, but being able to, to see that broader context of where things fit in, I think that's a huge part of bridging the communication gap that we yeah. currently have in the cannabis world versus sort of broader, uh, I don't know what the right word would be, conventional institutionalized uh, uh, science. You know, we're, we're learning all of these things and then trying to get it uh, properly communicated to doctors and other people and and to get it get our language wrapped up into their vocabulary you know it's, that's kind of one of the biggest disconnects it's like what are you talking about and uh, how do i make sense of this and it, when you can understand those super classes and and where these things fit in it becomes much easier to have those conversations with people that already understand a lot of they, you know they have their other niches that they understand um, and they're trying to wrap their head around what's real what's not about all this cannabinoid and cannabis science stuff um, that's such an important piece of, of getting this all pushed further. And, and, um, I guess where I'll, I'll go with this is, uh, to pick your brain on what are you most excited to see from the future of, um, you know, not just cannabis research, but cannabinoid research, terpene research, mm. you know, more broadly, what are you excited to see over the next five, 10 years and, and beyond? And, and what's kind of got you excited, um, when thinking about the future? So to be honest, it's, it's not even a cannabis thing that I, I'm yeah. excited about, right? So it's actually a change in the paradigm that I'm excited about, right? So, so yes. we now have universities that are actually for the first time offering curriculum that, are, that, that includes analytical chemistry methods in, in cannabis, um, you know, endocannabinoid system, you know, um, um, discussion in medical schools, right? So for the first time, right? So in the last couple of years, or I guess the one university in Michigan that first had uh, the, the, so maybe about three years for some places, right? Yeah, so, so yeah. But, but, but still it's, it's, it's recent, right? So, um, and I, and I think that excites me the most because without mm -hmm. that change, it didn't matter what we did. Right. If, if doctors were not willing to open their eyes and finally accept that the AMA has been lying to them for the last 80 <laughs> freaking years. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. We'd still be at ground zero. Right. So. Um, so because of that, you know, and I think a lot of that comes from Israel. Right. So they've been much more um, mm -hmm. open, you know, and, and, and have accepted it as a potential medicine for, for many years. Uh, you know, it. it because of that right now we're, we're starting to see things like you know everybody wanted to jump on the cbd bandwagon for coronavirus and and, and i at first came out against it not because i didn't believe it was true but because right. people wanted to jump on it without any evidence right so now that we have evidence and that it shows that it did include in, in fact decrease the, the 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 cytokine storm which was in fact helpful right. to you know either recovery of and in some cases, potentially preventing, because if you can't develop the cytokine storm, it seems like it wasn't right. transmitting very well, right? So, so there's all sorts of stuff that now that we understand that, as you said, they are, you know, the endocannabinoid system is an eicosanoid system. And so therefore, it is immune modulating. So now some of the anecdotal evidence about, you know, oh, cannabis is about homeostasis. Well, yeah, because the immune system is about homeostasis, right? So, right, so yeah. So, 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 so a lot of the stuff that was, you know, anecdotal, as you said before, we're starting to actually have some of that convert because yeah. some early adopters, because paradigm shifts. So that's what's got me excited because I see a future for continued improved research. That's what yeah. gets me excited. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I'm, I, it's something I've been waiting on for so long. Um, uh, I don't know if I ever shared with you, but I did my undergrad at the University of Mississippi and spent actually quite a bit of time at the cannabis lab there, oh, cool. um, and, which was a very fascinating experience. I was working for the IT department of the university at the time, so I was like fixing their GCs and stuff. <laughs> and uh, 
um, I, you know, thinking way back then, um, I've got an old picture of me, you know, sitting at one of their GCs, uh, you know, doing some work. And I remember, you know, that kid back then, you know, in undergrad had no idea, you know, what I was going to be doing a year from then, much less, you know, 15 years or whatever from then, um, you know, trying to just think about where this all might go and, and when, will universities all over the country have labs like this? You know, like that was something I was thinking about. Like, when is this just going to become a part of, you know, every university that's doing major agricultural research, like why, or, or natural products research yeah. broadly, you know, like, you know, when are they going to have this? And now we're, we're seeing it. And I've, I've been very fortunate to work with a couple of universities, um, particularly in the Southeast, since that's where I'm from initially, um, to try to, you know, now that hemp is, you know, been legalized now universities are like okay maybe i'm not going to risk federal funding if we no. approach this in a careful way and so you know i'm starting to get calls from people they're like hey i want to set up an analytical lab you know in this department of our school can you help us do that can you help us think about curriculum can you help us think about research ideas and i just get so excited and a lot of times i'm just happy to like volunteer my time to do that kind of stuff because i'm like Yes, absolutely. This is what I've been waiting for. I want right. to see more universities get online. Yes, absolutely. I will shortcut you as much as I possibly can so that, you know, your students can start diving into really interesting research projects and we all become the better for it. And um, and then this takes on a life of its own and, you know, folks like yourself and then, you know, in my small part <clears throat> coming along a little after Steep Hill, but you know, working in analytical labs and trying to wrap our heads around what's going on with these plants and these varieties and these different products and, you know, what's safe, what's not, all these really basic questions that we've had to tackle just as part of regulated cannabis markets in, in particular states. And now that's all, you know, it's like we, we've nurtured this, this thing long enough that now um, it's taking on this life of its own. And yeah, the universities are getting on board. And I was teaching a workshop just... Uh, it just ended last week and there was a PhD student in there that was, you know, sharing with me afterwards, like some very interesting research that she was going on to do at the university of Georgia, looking at um, metals accumulation in plants and in cannabis plants. I was like, that's great because people talk all the time about metals and cannabis, but we really don't know much about that either. Um, and so it just, it just really excites me that, you know, in some small way, uh, those of us that have sort of been doing some of the science in the early days, you know, in a very limited capacity, like now, I don't know, it's like our wings are starting to be yeah. able to, to kind of open up and, and fly. We can talk about it all and, and see it all evolve into something way beyond, you know, uh, even what I imagined. I, in general, I'm a fairly cynical person, so I really didn't actually expect things to progress to the extent that they have Um despite a lot of people being frustrated that it hasn't um, happened more, but yeah. yeah, but going back to like, you know, I spent a lot of time around the feds, uh, you know, both in the, the cannabis lab at Ole Miss and also working at the BLM and stuff. So I'm fairly cynical about what the federal government's going to do or, or how things are going to evolve. But, um, um, but it's, it's, it is, it's really, really exciting. And um, I guess one of the ways to, to wrap this all up, and this has been a great conversation. I've, I've yeah, very no, much really enjoyed speaking it. with yeah, you. Yeah. It's been really great. Um, can you share a little bit? And obviously, I know you know some stuff is protected, whatever you know. Um, but uh, can you share a little bit about what Front Rage is kind of um, you know what you're doing now, what you're looking forward to in the future, and then um, you know also let people know how to learn more about uh, the work that you're all doing and and about the company and. You know, basically just hand the podcast off to you to kind of get us wrapped up and close us oh, out. Wow, that's dangerous. Um, all right, so <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, um, I like it. <laughs> so, uh, what are we doing? Um, so, for me, um, you know, it's funny because as you were talking about the industry and and regulatory testing, and and I had a flashback in my head. You know, five years ago, I was a regulatory testing guy, right? So I ran a, right, you, yeah. know, or, you know, ran a, a, a testing lab that kind of had set the, the industry standard for a while. So, absolutely, um, you know, and, and so now I, I look at what I'm doing and I'm doing the same stuff, right? But it's a completely different focus, right? So now I'm, I'm, I'm focused on breeding and, you know, um, and understanding uh, the same chemistry, right? But from a non-regulatory, what, what can I do with it as opposed to what, what does it have, right? Um, yeah. But it's funny because 
a lot of people still call me and ask me for my perspective on the regulatory industry, even though I have not really been in the regulatory industry for almost two years now. And, and, you know, and, and I, I, I don't know whether I sometimes feel guilty about that. Like I've abandoned it because it's not my job anymore and I don't care. Right. Like, but, but I, I kind of do care. Right? So, too. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. right. So, you know, but you know, there's a certain amount of, you know, having bashed one's head against the wall for so long and, and the industry yeah. pushing back because they wanted to make money as opposed to care about safety. You know, you get to a point where, where you don't care, right? Like it's not my job. Yep. I, I'm now paid to do something else. You guys figured it out. I tried to talk to you before. Uh, that's a horrible, yeah. horrible position or, or attitude for me to have. And I, and I, and that's a character flaw on my, on my part. I admit it. So, uh, but, but re, the reality is, is that we've been having, we've been doing so much work and having so much fun uh, doing that work at front range that, you know, we, you know, I, I walked away and I never looked back. Um, and, and some of that fun has been just learning the differences in plants, right? Like we, yeah. we so, so one of the things that, uh, one of the things that I was, uh, allowed to do was to go absolutely ape shit and collect varieties from all over the world, right? So, so I accessioned, you know, 800, 900 different land races from around the world, you know, through all legally acquired through our, 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 so yeah. we have a, we have a division in, in Spain. Uh, we have import export license with, with Spain and, and all that other stuff, right? So, um, and, and from that, you know, came this understanding that first I said, we have this genetic bottleneck, right? But we, we realized that about two years ago when we stopped working on, strictly us varieties and we started to incorporate some of these other stuff from around the world but i was like holy crap dude we don't know anything like like we yeah. don't know anything right um and so that was uh, a really really amazing uh step to take because it, it, it allowed us to really look in at what we really didn't uh, didn't know right and so yeah. a lot of our focus came or, or w then went to looking at what was outside of what we had access to, right? And so already from that, like I, I have, you know, NOCO was a couple weeks ago in Colorado, and, and we had people, you know, clamoring for the stuff that wasn't even our regular catalog <laughs> stuff. We had the new, the new next year stuff out there, and like we had, so we had grown, a, you know, some flower. All the flowers gone. We have other flower that we can't get rid of, but that flower's gone, right? So. Because we now have a hemp variety that's alpha pinene dominant, never been seen before in the hemp, in, or at least never that we've seen a COA from, right? Right, hemp, it's right? actually characterized. Right, right, yeah. Right. So, so I've got so so we have gone and done the work to now start to get things that are not mercine dominant because all of the breeding yes. that's been done <laughs> over the years has made everything mercine dominant because mercine was the thing that has that really amazing sexy smell. Oh, we like that, right? So. Um, so before we started using chemistry to do this work, we, we kind of bred for the same thing, right? And, and so that's where that bottleneck came. And so, so, and now, because for us, you know, hemp is legal and I can take pollen from hemp and put it anywhere I want, right? So, yep. um, so we've taken some of that diversity that we found on the hemp CBD side, right? And we've been able to put it back into cannabis in our California operation. So now we have some amazing stuff coming out that's going to be hitting the California market, right? So right. that have some of these alpha pinene dominance and some of these, you know, terpinaline dominance. And, oh, and wow. you know, yeah. so, so, you know, so I'm really happy with the work that we've done, right? Um, my team has done a phenomenal job, uh, you know, um, adapting to um kind of uh the new the, the new the new us right so um and um and you know we've, we've been able to make some inroads into all sorts of stuff right we have some of our breeding with our with our spanish partner we have a snip chip that's coming out now that for our for our use it's got ten thousand different functional snips not 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 a hundred thousand snips that are just snips right 10,000 functionally yeah. characterized snips Functional. that mean something, right? QTLs for, <laughs> for important traits, right? So, so we are, we have gotten ourselves in 18 months to the point where an agronomics company needs to be, to be successful. Right. And that's what yeah. I'm really excited about because we did this in 18 months and, and that's now, what I was about to say. That's right, amazing. Right. And now remember I told you we, we, when we got to front range, we hit second gear, right? So now we're, we're, now we're about to hit third gear, right? And there's still two more <laughs> gears to go. So. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's yeah. incredibly yeah. exciting, and it and it is amazing what you've been able to accomplish in that short amount of time. Um, and I I envy you because I know, man, I. I can relate so much to what you were saying as far as working in the regulatory, you know, testing environment. Um, it gets it gets very frustrating and it gets old. It gets tiring. Um, and the lab so, shopping and all that crap. Yeah, so. yeah. And you know, I've I've been out of it for a couple of years now too, and it's it's felt really nice. And I do battle the exact same thing of just like. I don't care. I don't want to talk about it. Like, leave me alone, sort of thing. But also, one of my 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 focus in doing a lot of that was quality management and 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 stuff. So it's it's a big part of my past. Um, but it is it is hard to work with. But I'm very envious because I can only imagine how freeing it felt. Oh my god, to dude. to after, get away from yes. the regulatory stuff. Yeah, and then just be like, finally, we're in R and D. Finally, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. this is our our main focus, and that is that is something I've I've dreamt about. <laughs> I literally mm -hmm. have had dreams about of uh, being able to get away mm -hmm. from the the stickiness of all of the regulatory testing and mm -hmm. just be able to poke around and investigate and investigate in general. It's so hard to get into positions where you can do investigative research. Um, just in in all of science, that's that's a very challenging thing to do. So my hats off to you that uh, you guys have gotten to this point. Um, and I'm really, really excited to see, uh, where your journey leads. It's been a great one to follow, you know, so far as being an observer on the sidelines and so to speak, it's been really fun to see the work that you've done and where you're at now. And I can't wait to see what front range, uh, you know, pulls out of their hat in the next, you know, I can only imagine what you'll accomplish in the next three years, five years. Um, well, it's going to uh, be really, so really exciting. I, I, I hope we're given that much opportunity, um, you know, so we're working our ass off because, you know, every one of us knows that we lead a, we, we lead a special existence, right? So to do yeah. what we do, to, to have such an academic focus in, in a industrial application, right? So yeah. I have been very fortunate, right? I have had people believe in the vision, right? And both yeah. in Steep Hill and Front Range that are are willing to pony the bill for the work that we do, right? And 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 yep. it's it's not cheap, right? So it's not cheap, it, you know. And yep. the, the results don't always come immediately, but you know, when yeah. we we, yeah. we build to a point where we can start to produce more often than not, right? So you know, and and as a reward, right? You know, we 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 give out stuff like the THC stuff, we you know the, all the all the terpene stuff. You know, we we've filed a couple patents, we have a couple more in the works. Um, you know, we we've uh, in the last year we've developed about 14 new proprietary genetics for the cannabis market that are all based on wow. sativas that people have not seen stuff like this before, right? So. Um, and, and, and so that, so that begs the question, who wants a sativa? Well, I want a sativa. And so <laughs> when I was doing this breeding, it was for me. So I hope people like it. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> There'll be some demographic out there that vibes with your style. That, uh... <laughs> um, but, but, but now, but, but, you know, and, um, but to be fair, right. So, so, you know, um, we are, it's the same team. My team is also the product development team, right? So. You know, we yeah. we do put the make money hat on too, right? And so uh, yeah, our our, our latest to. our our latest breeding things have been in the more traditional markets. The OGs people want the gas, and people want so so. Uh, you know, I've I have um, accepted the fact that I can't just breed for me anymore. So <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm particularly excited too to see the work that you continue to do with land races because um, there was one company that. They've come on the podcast a couple of times. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Real Seed Company. Um, they do a lot of accessions and stuff all over. Um, and we've talked quite a bit about <clears throat> kind of misunderstandings around land races and and some of the I don't know if contamination is the right word, but you know um, there there's been a lot of crossbreeding um, with yeah. land races where people get excited and they're like, ah, oh, I want to you know, see what these things do together, or they introduce commercial varieties back into uh, places where, you know, land races are. You so know, that, so still... that's unfortunate. So there was a yeah. lot of that. Right. And, and I think, and yeah. people did it maliciously. Right. And, and I, and I, and I, yeah. and I yeah. think that was a really dark spot in the cannabis, in the cannabis industry evolution. Right. Yes. People yeah, would go looking for genetics, get land 
indigenous, you know, population genetics, yep. and then toss seed behind, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and, and not even feminized seed, right? They were tossing right, yeah. true Just male, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, they were tr throwing out true male, you know, containing populations so that oh, it diluted yeah. what was left. Yeah, no, the, yeah. some of this stuff was done purposely. So, I, so I spent a fair amount of time in, in Jamaica um, working with UTEC um, and with Steve Hill, and there's a, a, a whole stuff, bunch of stuff going on there now. Um, but you know, we we find like Dutch genetics in mm. places in in the middle of a valley in freaking Jamaica where no Dutch yeah. genetics should ever have been, right? Yeah. So it, it's it's been done, and and you know maybe I'm being a little harsh. Maybe it was done accidentally. So. so I mean I think there's I think there's both. You know yeah. certainly there's been accidental uh, stuff that's happened. Certainly there's been malicious stuff, yeah. and I think there's been well intentioned uh, people that have gotten excited about breeding that have also caused some of that without yeah. understanding what they're doing um right. and so i think it's 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 a little bit of everything um i've heard definitely heard stories from all angles and so i have no doubts that there's um been very intentional malicious um destruction of um you know uh these uh genomes <laughs> um so I'm, I'm glad that you've been working on collecting what you can and and studying that and something that i i teach about you know as far as uh, talking about this concept of the genetic bottleneck, you know, I say, what if a virus came along that affected every modern commercial cannabis variety that exists, but maybe there's some, uh, you know, land race strain that has been naturalized to an environment for a really long time that maybe has had to deal with that virus in the past, you know, and what if your only way to save all of your commercial cannabis is to get some resistance from one of these cannabis varieties that you've now decimated that doesn't exist anymore. Um, you know, it, it's not saying that that's a problem you can't overcome, but it, it just highlights long, just, if you go too long, it, it we'll see that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. And you don't know where the tipping point is. You don't know at what point have you gone too far or not until you're dealt with, you know, the stressor to deal with and, and, um, so I hope that people listening recognize, you know, I and mean, we've talked about so many different things, but I, I just wanted to, to pin this that I, I do hope people listening recognize the importance of that work specifically in trying to um, preserve uh, the relatively limited amount of genetic diversity among cannabis plants um, as it currently stands right. and, and, and try to keep that from being totally diluted or or contaminated as, especially as more and more countries around the world are starting to change their laws. Um, you know, well, we're just seeing a lot, a lot more mixing, a lot of stuff crossing borders. Um, you know, very casually compared to you know the way that it had to be done in the past. But but we're setting a <coughs> sorry, we're sorry. setting a dangerous trend, right? Um, yeah. So I'm going to bring up a horror story from North American agriculture. At one point, North America was the dominant producer of white peaches in the world. Mm. Right? White peaches uh, were, in fact, you know, the Georgia peach was, you know, it was, it was yeah. uh, traditionally a white peach, right? So, so um, what happened was is that all of those white peach trees were identical; they were all clones. Yeah. Right, and so a virus came along or a fungus came along and it literally devastated the white peach industry and the white nectarine industry in the United States, right? So largely white peaches and white nectarines are hard to find and they're usually imported now, right? So, yeah. and that's the danger of, and, and what I'm trying to talk about there is the danger of a monoculture crop, right? Yeah. Where we have bred everything out or we have made everything the same, right? So like it's we like one variety of corn, so everybody grows at one variety of corn, right? Well, the way that what that does is it allows species that are resistant to the natural, you know, and um defenses of that plant to evolve and then come along and wipe out the entire crop. Bang, done, and you're done. Right. So so what do we do in the cannabis industry? So, um, but, but the problem is, is that, you know, is that now everybody in South America, everybody in Europe, they're all looking for U.S. varieties. They're looking for yep. Jacaranda, yeah, yeah. right? And yeah. so what's going to happen? 
right? So we're going to send illegally, yeah, whatever though, yeah. but we're but we're going to end up with monoculture, right, across the yeah. world, right? Because everybody wants the hot U.S. strain, uh, you know. I mean, well, yeah. So yeah, so there's a real exactly. danger. There's a real danger that we see some of the same mistakes made early in, yep. in agronomics, you know, um, happen again in cannabis. So we we got to be careful. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, another great example is the uh, chestnut, um, something that, that's uh, still problematic um, yeah. in eastern United States. Um, yeah. I think that was a, a fungal thing. but yep. um, Many know, of them are. Uh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, hope people listening recognize the importance of all this. And I, I know we've meandered in all sorts of directions here, um, talking about cannabinoid genetics and terpenes and land race strains and uh, philosophical approaches to, to science, but um, uh, this has been uh, absolutely delightful. I, in seeing your presentation, I knew that if we could get together, I knew we would have a good conversation. Uh, you know, sometimes you can just tell uh, about people. So um, I really, really appreciate you being willing to, uh, you know, talk to me for this long. I know we've gone over an hour, um, but it's Reggie, been, thanks so awesome, much. Man. And, and, and as you know, uh, things come out. If you guys publish more papers or whatever, I'd be happy to have you on to talk more and maybe even dive into if there are specific issues, you know, going on in the moment um, that people could, you know, benefit from kind of learning some of the science behind it and everything. Be happy to to have you on again. Thanks, Jason. It's been awesome. I really appreciate it. So, you know, there there's there are some podcasts that end up being just question and answer, and there are some that are are, are really outstanding discussions right and this is one of those so so thanks very much so uh, this, this so well, uh, i so you know um my other favorite podcast guy is shango so i'm gonna say that you, so yeah so you're you rank up there with shango like 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 this he oh, makes it man. fun for me to be there right so so he makes it fun to be there right the, the conversations are dynamic and good and, and this was just like that so i said so I'd, I'd come back in a second so thanks Oh man, well that's that's a huge compliment for me. Um, thank you so much for for sharing that. That's definitely my goal is for this to be relatively, you know, organic, but hitting you know primary points that that I you know I think people need to hear about. But at the end of the day, um, yeah, it is about meaningful but but fun discussions. Yeah, um, so um, that's awesome, man. Well, thanks so much. Keep up the great work, Reggie, and I look forward to talking to you very soon. Cool. Thanks very much. Have a good day. All right. I'll take it easy. Have a great rest of your uh, day and weekend. If you want to learn more about cannabis, check out the Curious About Cannabis book on Amazon.com and other major online book retailers.